First Patriots, Chapter 8. On a crisp winter morning, we landed alongside a large red brick building. The bottom level looked like a marketplace where several merchants, fishermen, meat and produce sellers, and peddlers of every kind were selling their goods. Check all that apply. Let's listen to that again. Merchants, fishermen, meat and produce sellers, and peddlers of every kind were selling their goods. The second level had several windows. Some were opened and many voices could be heard inside. You realize we landed a day after the Boston Massacre, right? Liberty said. Is this March 6th, 1770? I asked. Yes, but you said the massacre happened on March 5th. Liberty reminded me. Yes, I'm aware of that, I whispered, but I didn't want my students to witness the Boston civilians who died. Why is it that the past always seems colder than the future, said Freedom. It's freezing out here. I reached for my travel bag and handed Freedom and Cam their colonial clothes. Put these clothes over your modern day clothes. You should be warmer with a double layer. Freedom and Cam eagerly put on the clothes like they were racing each other. I want, it, I want the two of you to stay close to me, I said. Let's walk to the front of the building and see where we are. Liberty closed his eyes and concentrated before saying, We're definitely in Boston, and this building is... I can see the name, but I'm not sure I can pronounce it. Fenwell Hall, said Freedom. It must be a French name. How did you know that? asked Cam. I read Liberty's mind, Freedom said, smiling. You can read minds? asked Cam with a worried expression on his face. Don't worry, I can only communicate with animals, but I do have x-ray vision. What? Cam blurted out as he walked behind Liberty. I'm just kidding, Freedom laughed. Fanwell Hall with a capital F and a capital H. Make sure you have, it's a proper noun. Make sure you have your two capitals. And you'll see it right here. Let's count the paragraphs. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six paragraphs down. Fenwell Hall. What? Cam blurted out as he walked behind Liberty. I'm just kidding, Freedom laughed. But wouldn't that be cool, Liberty said. I wish I had x-ray vision. You don't need it, I said. You have your time travel sense. Can you sense Samuel Adams in this building? Liberty paused and then said, yep, he's definitely in there. And Fenwell Hall is a special building, I said. It served as the Patriot headquarters or meeting place to discuss the Stamp Act, the Boston Massacre, the Tea Crisis, and other British laws that burdened the business. What did they discuss there? Let's read that part again, the last paragraph. Stamp Act, the Boston Massacre, the Tea Crisis, and other British laws that burdened the colonists. There's Fenwell Hall again right there in the last paragraph too. So if you need to see where how to spell it here. Where's Liberty? Freedom asked. We turned and spotted Liberty near the front of Fenwell Hall. He was staring at what looked like a sign. We followed Liberty and as we got closer, I read the sign that had caught his complete attention. It read, Fenwell Hall, Boston, the cradle of Liberty, dedicated in 1763 in the cause of liberty. Have you ever seen anything so beautiful? Asked Liberty, who was nearly crying. Although I don't remember sleeping in a cradle. In fact, I don't think I'd fit inside a cradle unless it was a giant one. Oh, well, hey, you should take a picture of me beside this sign. After a quick photo, I said, let's look inside the building. What are we looking for? Asked Freedom. I want to meet Samuel Adams. Who are they looking for? Samuel Adams. Today he's giving an impassioned speech about last night's horrific events. Liberty replied, I'm going to sit this one out. I mean, I'm glad this Adams guy is on our side, 
but I don't want to risk getting yelled at. Why do you say that? Freedom asked, a little worried. I interjected. From what I've learned, Samuel Adams is not a patient person, but I'm sure he's... You said he was pig-headed and needs anger management classes, Liberty said. Well, I, I never actually met the man. It's just what I've read in history books, I said defensively. So why are we meeting him? Cam asked. I sighed and explained. Samuel Adams may not have the genius and social skills of Benjamin Franklin, and he may not be as brilliant and lighthearted as Patrick Henning, but he definitely played an important role in America's independence. Let me tell the three of you something that I hope you never forget. You will meet people in your life that get on your nerves. Maybe they challenge your ideas or they're not willing to completely agree with you. That doesn't mean they're bad people. Yes, Samuel Adams was said to be a stubborn and quick-tempered man. But I think we'll see that he was an incredible motivator. The point is, I believe that God knew he would need different people with a variety of personalities to create a free America. He needed men and women who weren't afraid to speak their minds. He needed people who would not back down. And frankly, this country needs more of that today. Our country needs kids like you to speak up when our liberties are being threatened. Our forefathers said and did hard things even when they knew it might not be the popular thing. Samuel Adams is one of those people. He wasn't trying to win a popularity contest. He was trying to motivate people to take a stand and fight for their liberties. Thanks, Mr. Revere, said Cam. I know peer pressure makes a lot of kids go along with the crowd, even when they know it's not the right thing. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Revere, echoed Freedom. My mom named me Freedom because she hoped that it would give me the courage to stand up to others who might take advantage of me. I don't do a very good job at that. But now I'm anxious to meet Samuel Adams. Maybe I can pick up a few tips from him. No kidding, agreed Cam. Let's go meet the Samulator. The what? Liberty said. You know, like the Terminator. The Samulator. Well, good luck with that. I'll meet you outside when you finish, said Liberty. As we entered the front doors, I noticed the hall inside was packed with people from the entrance all the way to the platform on the other side. The man standing near the podium was dressed in simple colonial fashion. He looked like he was in his late forties. I immediately felt his penetrating stare, which seemed to reach all the way across the room and into my soul. When he started to speak, I knew instantly that this was the exceptional American Samuel Adams. There he is, I said. That's the simulator, asked Cam. Show some respect, said Freedom. Samuel Adams. Yes, that's him, I said, mesmerized by what he was saying. Samuel looked over the crowd and boldly said, The governor of Massachusetts says that I'm the great incendiary. He says I spread lies about the British Empire and spread stories about the injustice of the king. But I will tell you that my purpose and my passion is to warn against the hostile designs of Great Britain. Crowded room erupted with shouts and cheers. Samuel Adams continued, Furthermore, I accept your nomination to chair a committee that will petition Governor Hutchinson for the immediate removal of British, British troops from the city of Boston. Hear, hear, shouted members of the crowd. America should never forget the horrid massacre in Boston, said Samuel, when five innocent patriots were shot by British muskets. We will honor men like Crispus Attucks, who was the first to fall, struck twice in the chest by bullets. Again, the crowd erupted with anger. It was beginning to look and sound like a mob. That's harsh, said Cam. I remember hearing the gunshots in the classroom. I bet that's when the patriots got shot. Who was the first man to die in the Boston Massacre? Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks. There'll be a picture of him in a bit. Yeah, said Freedom. But I don't like that innocent people are getting killed. No kidding, said Cam soberly. And too bad about Crispus Attucks. I've never heard of him before. I whispered. History tells us that Attucks was of African and Native American descent and had fled to Boston after escaping his enslavers. In fact, he has a monument in Boston that hails him as a hero of the American Revolution, the first patriot to give his life for the cause. I wonder if he would have still gone to King Street 
and protested like that if he knew he might die, said Freedom thoughtfully. That's a good question, Freedom, I said, but I think a hero does what needs to be done and says what needs to be said, despite the consequences, even if it means giving your life. That's why I consider Samuel Adams an American hero. He could have hanged, he could have hanged for the things he said, but it didn't stop him. As the public meeting ended, we weaved our way through the crowded hall and headed toward the podium. We'll try to introduce ourselves to Samuel Adams. It would be great to meet him and ask a few questions, I said, but I'm not sure I see him anymore. It feels like everyone's really fired up, Freedom said. No kidding, Cam said. Feels like we're at a tailgate party before a football game. It's too bad Samuel Adams can't come to a game. I bet he'd be an awesome cheerleader. Oh, sure. Let's invite Samuel Adams to a football game. I'm sure he doesn't have anything better to do, Freedom said, a voice of reason. And this is a picture of Crispus Attucks, one of the men killed in the Boston Massacre, considered the first to die, first patriot to die. And just what am I being invited to? asked Samuel from behind us. I could hardly believe I was standing face to face with the legendary Samuel Adams. I said, sir, Mr. Adams, Samuel, or do you go by Sam? I mean, it's a pleasure to meet you. We're huge admirers of yours and fellow patriots. I'm not looking for admirers, stated Samuel, but I am looking to grow the cause of freedom. Now tell me about this football game. Is this a game for patriots? Actually, yes, laughed Cam. The New England Patriots are a football team in Massachusetts. Personally, I like the Broncos, but Freedom elbowed Cam in the ribs. I quickly tried to change the subject and said, these are two of my students, Cam and Freedom, and I'm Rush Revere, history teacher and historian. I brought them to hear your speech and hopefully help them understand the importance of fighting for freedom. We were very inspired and motivated by your speech. In fact, we'd love to help support the cause any way we can. Your name is Freedom, you say, asked Samuel, who turned to look at Freedom. That is a name worth having and a cause worth fighting for. Well, I'm not really a fighter, said Freedom. Nonsense, shouted Samuel. His word made Freedom practically jump. Samuel firmly said, we were born to fight. A baby fights for his first breath. Our hearts fight to beat every second of every day. If you stood between a hungry wolf who was after a younger sister or brother and you had a club in your hand, what would you do? Freedom looked nervous about answering, but finally said, I would fight it off. What? I didn't hear you. Say it louder, Samuel prodded. Freedom tried again, this time a little louder. I said, I would fight off the wolf. Of course you would, Samuel said, sounding almost angry. And King George is simply a wolf that wears a crown. Do you understand? Yes, said Freedom timidly. Don't ever forget that you are a fighter, Freedom. You are worth fighting for. Freedom nodded and gave a weak but sincere smile. Samuel turned toward me and asked, Did you say your name is Rush Revere? Yes, that's right, I said and smiled. I am a good friend with Paul Revere, a fellow patriot here in Boston, said Samuel. In fact, I'm on my way to visit with him now. He is a master silversmith, and I am in need of his services. Would you care to join me? Really? I asked with wonder. It would be a great honor to meet him as well. I'm sure we're related. Come then, said Samuel. We will travel together. His shop isn't far from here. Thank you. That is very generous of you, I stammered. I was practically shaking from the anticipation and excitement of meeting my favorite exceptional American, Paul Revere. Who is Samuel Adams taking them to meet? Paul Revere. Proper noun, capital P and capital R. As we followed Samuel out the doors and down the stairs of Fenwell Hall, a man who I assumed was a fellow patriot called to speak with Samuel. Samuel stepped away briefly, and as I waited, I overheard bits and pieces of their conversation. Something about a secret meeting and the Sons of Liberty. Interesting. Cam interrupted and said, Mr. Revere, we found Liberty. He's down by those food vendors. Apparently, someone spilled a whole pot of baked beans, and Liberty decided he'd help clean things up. Yes, cleaning up food is his specialty, I laughed. 
Tell him to hurry because we're following Samuel Adams to Paul Revere's silversmith shop. Samuel finished his conversation about the secret meeting and said, I apologize for keeping you waiting. Not a problem, I said. Lead the way, Mr. Adams. Cam and Freedom followed close behind, and Freedom led Liberty by the halter. The streets of Boston were buzzing with colonists. Their moods seemed somber as they went about their errands. I noticed many dirt streets that branched off from the main cobblestone street that we traveled on. Samuel pointed out several of his favorite shops along Main Street. What types of shops were along Main Street? Check all that apply. Here it comes. A tavern, a fruit vendor, a bakery, and a barbershop. Also, a hat store, a fish market, a pipe maker, and a flower shop. Merchants lined the streets, and a variety of signs hung over their doors and windows. The hoop petticoat, the four sugar loaves, the chest of drawers, and the spring clock and watches were just a few of the signs that caught my eye. For the most part, we have all the luxuries we need. England does ship goods for us to purchase, but I prefer to purchase items made in America, Samuel said. Fenwell Hall, as it looked in Boston around this period. In addition, redcoats could be seen policing the streets. They traveled together in groups of five or six. We crossed the street whenever redcoats were approaching. In fact, I noticed most of the colonists tried to avoid the British soldiers. As we walked, Samuel said, Paul Revere is a master silversmith. After he fought in the French and Indian War, he took over his father's shop. Paul Revere is a master silversmith. You're just going to put the word silversmith. You're finishing the sentence. Silversmith, one word. The period at the end. You don't need the hyphen. Let's double check that. Correct. No capital, just silversmith, period. Curious, I asked, exactly what kinds of things does he make? I don't think there's anything he couldn't make. He is a true artisan of silver. And is this why you are visiting Paul Revere today? You want to purchase one of his silver pieces, I inquired. No, I'm going to ask Paul to use his skills to engrave a piece of copper. You see, Paul Revere has a small printing press in his shop. Whatever he engraves on a thin piece of copper can be used as a template for his printing press. The piece of copper can be printed over and over again, said Samuel. And what exactly do you plan to engrave on the piece of copper? You get right to the point, Rush Revere. I like that, said Samuel. The British Army has given us a golden opportunity. I have called it the Boston Massacre. In fact, we approach King Street now. This is where the tragedy occurred last night. Overhearing our conversation, Cam said, I recognize the customs office and the old brick church. Indeed, back in the classroom, Liberty had dreamed a remarkable simulation of the crime scene. As we walked to the place where the crowd of colonists stood shouting at the British soldiers, I saw thin patches of snow in the shadows of the buildings. A large icicle fell from a two-story building and shattered into dozens of large chunks. A thick, jagged piece tumbled across the street until it hit my leather shoe. I looked down at the piece of broken ice and saw a large, dark stain on the cobblestone. A cold wind blew across my face and gave me goosebumps. I knelt to get a better look and shivered at the thought of what had happened at this very spot last night. Behind me, Samuel said, I have talked to many witnesses about the event last night, and it appears that the British soldiers indeed fired upon several Americans. However, I've also discovered that the Americans who gathered were not all peaceful bystanders. Most likely, some provoked and taunted the soldiers. Sticks and stones and ice were thrown at the redcoats. The angry crowd started pressing in on the nine soldiers. And that's when someone shouted fire? I softly said, remembering the event from the classroom. Correct, said Samuel. My investigation tells me that Captain Thomas Preston ordered his soldiers not to fire. However, by then it was too late. One of his men fired his musket, and soon after, several more shots were fired, 
killing five unarmed men. It was bound to happen with the Quartering Act, quartering troops so close to the civilian population. It is like putting a fuse so close to a flame. Perhaps both sides are guilty, I said, finally standing and looking at Samuel. Perhaps, said Samuel. My cousin, John Adams, has been asked to defend the British soldiers who were at the massacre. Only a handful of witnesses will ever know what truly happened. Who was Samuel Adams' cousin? John Adams. Capital J, capital A, proper noun. John Adams. However, I'm a big believer that people will believe what we tell them, and I intend to spread the word to help spread the cause of the Patriots. We can use this to our advantage. And this plan involves Paul Revere, I said matter-of-factly. It does, Samuel said. Paul Revere's silversmith shop is not far from here. I looked for Cam and Freedom and saw them near Liberty. Freedom was huddled up close against Liberty's neck. I walked over and asked, are you cold? I'm fine, said Freedom quietly. Cam replied, I guess this is the ugly part of history, eh? Yes, I said. I'm sorry if this was a hard thing to experience. I hadn't planned to. It's okay. I'm glad we came, said Freedom. But it's a weird feeling to think about what happened here last night. Cam agreed. Yeah, I know. It's just a street, but it feels like a cemetery. Samuel called from across the street and said, We must be on our way. A cold wind blew again across our faces. It chilled me to the bone as the image of those who lost their lives seemed to lie very near the stain-filled streets. We continued following Samuel in silence and soon heard the sound of someone pounding metal. Ah, here we are. Paul Revere's silversmith shop, said Samuel. I was glad we'd arrived. My somber mood changed to wonder as I thought about meeting the one and only Paul Revere. I straightened my coat and I felt like I was a little boy again, ready to meet Santa Claus. I peered through the window shop and noticed the most beautiful hand handcrafted pieces of silver I had ever seen. The Boston Tea Party was planned here at the Green Dragon Tavern. What was planned at the Green Dragon Tavern? The Boston Tea Party. Boston Tea Party. You need all four words, all with capitals. Capital T for the, capital B for Boston, capital T for T, and capital P for party. All four words, the Boston Tea Party. Spoons, cups, trays, bowls, and teapots adorned the window display. I like that bowl with the horse engraved on the side of it, said Freedom. I like it too, whispered Liberty into Freedom's ear. His craftsmanship is impressive, Samuel said. Believe it or not, he even crafted a small silver chain for a pet squirrel. I laughed at the thought of it. Seriously, laughed Cam? I wish I could get a picture of that. Such a picture would be senseless, said Samuel, clearly not seeing the humor of it. As Samuel opened the door, I saw a man sitting behind an anvil. Hot sparks burst between the anvil and the heavy hammer, each time it connected with the silver that he worked with. I could practically feel the hot furnace from the doorway and certainly smelled the melting metal. As we walked to the doorway, I left the door ajar just a bit so Liberty could hear our conversation. My heart was beating fast and my palms felt cold and sweaty. I didn't realize how nervous I would feel upon meeting my boyhood hero. I had met dozens of exceptional Americans, but this one was extra special for me. Paul, my good friend, said Samuel, may I introduce you to my new friends, Rush Revere and his students, Cam and Freedom. Paul set down his hammer and wiped his brow. He looked like a strong man with broad shoulders and mighty forearms. He wore a leather apron over his linen shirt, which was rolled up at the sleeves. His hair was pulled back into a ponytail, and he immediately smiled at me like we were long-lost brothers. All right, let's look at our question. What kinds of things did Paul Revere make? Oh, we got to go back up to the top. Okay, I'll read it. Let's see, where is it? Beautiful handcraft. Oh, way at the tippy top. Spoons, cups, trays, bowls, and teapots. 
spoons, cups, trays, bowls, and teapots. With a last name like that, I'm sure you must be br a brilliant man, said Paul laughing. It's a pleasure to meet you. He reached out his hand and I did the same. His handshake was firm and he looked me straight in the eyes. To what do I owe this visit? I said, I am a history teacher and historian, and I have been a great admirer of all you've done for America's independence. Paul laughed heartily and said, I like this Revere. He speaks of our independence as if it has already happened. Yes, it seems all the Revere's are true patriots, said Samuel. I will tell you why I have come, but first I must show you this drawing. Samuel unrolled a piece of parchment that he was carrying. I asked a man by the name of Henry Pelham to draw this illustration of the massacre on King Street last night. He showed it to Paul Revere. Massacre, Paul said with a surprised grin. I found myself smiling with him and not knowing why. It's as if his smile was contagious. I, Paul said, ha, huh, I should not be surprised that you chose a word with such drama. Paul laughed again. I could see that this was a man who loved life. He made me feel right at home in a way that Samuel Adams definitely didn't. He was good at his craft, and his customers probably enjoyed him as much as his handiwork. Paul turned in my direction and said, Be careful of what Samuel tells you. He is very good at spinning a story to his own benefit. Bending the truth is his specialty. Paul slapped Samuel on the back and laughed again while Samuel grimaced. Paul continued, the word massacre makes it sound like the redcoats were premeditated and cold-blooded. What is Samuel Adams' specialty, according to Paul Revere? Bending the truth, sword fighting, or giving speeches? Bending the truth. Tall tales, exaggerating. Some of us fight with swords and some of us fight with words, said Samuel with a glint in his eye. I call it the Boston Massacre because I want Americans to always remember the horrific event of March 5th, 1770. I peered at the drawing and noticed that it showed British soldiers firing at peaceful Boston citizens. With a bit of anger, Samuel said to Paul, and why do you criticize me for lighting a fire under our fight for freedom? My intent is to remind all Americans how unjust and unfair King George has been to the colonists, colonies. He is trying to cripple our economy by taxing everything. He wants to crush our hopes of independence. He will stop at nothing until he kills our chance for freedom. I agree, said Paul, smiling. No need to bark up my tree. Boston is clearly being targeted by the British Empire. King George sends more and more troops to Boston. We must do something. I assume you have a plan? You always do, Paul said, laughing. Samuel nodded and said, yes, I do. I need the help of a master silversmith to engrave this picture on a copper plate so we can print and distribute it to as many Americans as possible. I can do it, said Paul. It will take some time, but I can do it. Well, if you cannot do it, perhaps the printer and patriot Benjamin Franklin can, teased Samuel with a serious look on his face. Paul's laughter bounced off the walls of the small silversmith's shop. He said, you really know how to motivate a person. Surely I was biased, but I loved Paul Revere's attitude. He never seemed to doubt his own ability, and he was always optimistic about getting the job done. I wished I could stay with him all day and listen to his adventures and stories. Just then the door creaked open and Liberty stumbled inside. Let's do our date first. What was the date of the Boston Massacre? Okay, all the way back up to the top. March 5th, 1770. March 5th, so you can do the number with a comma, 1770, or you can spell it out like they did in the book. March 5th, comma, 1770. You don't need to do both, just do one or the other and you don't need a comma after the 1770. And there's a picture, a painting of Paul Revere. He was born in 1735 and died in 1818. Freedom whispered, oh, there's Liberty. 
He was listening too closely and accidentally fell into the door. Is this your horse? Paul asked, walking to the door. Oh, yes, I apologize. He is a curious animal, and I'm sure he was just looking for us. I am looking for a new horse, said Paul. Would you consider selling him? Oh, no, I couldn't, I said. We've been through a lot together. Before you go, I have a gift for Cam and Freedom, said Paul. He walked to the back of the shop and then returned with two silver objects. They are whistles, said Paul proudly. They make a very loud, high-pitched sound. I recommend you use this in case of an emergency only. He laughed again and we all laughed with him. I turned to Samuel Adams and Paul Revere and said, I will forever remember this day, gentlemen. Thank you for your dedication and your bravery. As a teacher of history, I will make sure your names are remembered as exceptional Americans. We are far from exceptional, said Samuel seriously. True, but I'm a little closer than Samuel, Paul said jokingly. As Cam and Freedom left the shop, Samuel lowered his voice and said, I invite you to join our secret society of patriots called the Sons of Liberty. Paul is also a son of liberty. I feel I can trust you, and we need good men who have the courage to fight for freedom, no matter the cost. I'm honored, I said without hesitation. I will find you the next time I am in town. What did Paul Revere give Tommy and Freedom? A cup, a whistle, a spoon, or a teapot? As we parted ways, I thought about the commitment I had just made, the commitment that all the Sons of Liberty had made. Oh, what was the name of the secret society of, Patrick, of Patriots Samuel Adams asked them to join? Ah, uh, here it is right here. Sons of Liberty. That's like a secret club. Only Patriots allowed. Sons of Liberty. Proper noun. Capital S. You don't need to capitalize the O in of. Capitalize the L in Liberty. Sons of Liberty. Another picture of Paul Revere. Their imprint in American history would forever be remembered during the famous Boston Tea Party. As I left the shop, I saw Cam and Freedom sitting on Liberty's saddle. Both were plugging their noses. As I got closer to Liberty, I realized why. What's that smell? I asked, grimacing. Just then, Liberty tooted and said, Excuse me, I am, I may have sampled some beans earlier, and well, let's just say I'll have plenty of gas to get us through the time portal. Oh, I simply shook my head and smiled. It was definitely time to jump back to Manchester Middle School. And there's a picture of the old state house as it looks today in Boston, Massachusetts. <laughs>